This morning, we stop at MPLS. So now we are going to, to see how this uh, protocol works and how we, what's the benefits of MPLS in a network. Um, so if, if we if we look at the scenario we have seen when we had only OSPF, you remember, so you have your domain here, and we can sp you can split it in two areas, but it's no more the, the problem. And you have here a BGP link with outside. As you know, now we have about 30, uh, 350,000 routes in the current internet. It means that when you are doing BGP with a provider, this provider may inject you these 350,000 routes on all the routers will have to know, to learn, about these prefixes. So that's a lot of memory in this router. That's a lot of traffic also for management. So it may cause problem when you want to, to manage your router because here you take a lot of resource for that management. It doesn't mean that it takes resource for forwarding. We can do forwarding at the line speed with this number of entries. So a packet arrive, you look at the destination address, you find the best prefix match for the existing, existing interface, and you can do it with 350,000 uh, 350, routes without any problem. But it means that you create a lot of traffic to manage these routes. So what we are going to start now is to try to isolate the core network from the outside. So this way, if we are able to isolate the core network from outside, then we will not need all these routes. So it's not something new. You remember, during the first class, we saw how we can put bridging inside a metropolitan area network and how we can reduce, by encapsulating a frame into a frame, how we can reduce the number of entries in the core bridges. So this is the same technique we are going to do in, uh, with uh, MPLS, but in fact it will not be encapsulation, but adding a tag and we will do switching on that tag. So this is the first advantage of MPLS, isolate the core from the outside. The second advantage is that here we will continue to have an IGP routing protocol that will be used in your area. So it can be OSPF, it can be IS to IS, it's your choice. But you know that IGP takes the decision for you. So in fact it will select a shortest path and your packet will follow this way. The problem is that you don't control the path taken by your packet because it's your IGP that does the work for you. So with MPLS, and you, and you remember what we have said uh, on Friday, is that if you have your shorted path tree and you know that you will send packet by this and this way, in fact, it's not the real route taken by the packets because you have a local decision, but then you send to a next stop, and this next stop has also a local decision, decision, and they are not synchronized. So what you believe is, is to be the path is in fact just the shorted, shorted path, and the real path taken by packet can be different. So you don't have a good vision of the forwarding using an IGP. So with MPLS, we can use it because it's very convenient. You do nothing and the system decides for you. But you can also force some routes 
inside your network. So you may say, I want my packet to take that route because I know that I have a lot of bandwidth on this route. And for that special customer, I will allocate some resources on the special customer will have some dedicated resources and a guarantee of bandwidth for all its traffic. So it thinks you can do with MPLS and you cannot do with uh, routing, standard routing protocol. So we are going to, to see that kind of things. And in my class here, I will just focus on the interconnection between IGP and MPLS. And when you will go, you will go to REN, you will see other way to manage MPLS, especially how you can do traffic engineering using uh, this protocol. So here, it resumes what I said. So you are a provider, and you have some router, so some router that will be at the edge of your network. This router will be used either to connect your customer, so companies or other um, customer, to your network, and you, some other edge will be used to talk with other providers. So this, the green one, it is guaranteed that you will do BGP because you, uh, you have to exchange your uh, knowledge of your network or maybe of the rest of the internet with this provider and you will do it using BGP and with your customer is not so mandatory but usually you do also BGP with your uh, customer to know the route that are inside the network. So this will lead to two kinds of network of two kinds of routers. One will be the provider edge. It means that it's at the edge of the provider network. And you will have provider router. It means that it's a core network. And here, this router has to go as fast as possible because here you will have high speed links that will uh, compose your network. So here, performances are, are very important. So we will call them P network. So let's take now an example of what we can do if we don't have MPLS. So here, so it's an old slide because I put only 300,000 routes, and now it's 350,000 routes. But here you receive 300,000 routes. So as I say, the first way is to use OSPF or ISIS as we saw it and inject an external root database. All these routes and all these routers, these P router, will have to know all these prefixes. And it's stupid because, for example, if I look at router R8, I may have 300,000 routes but I have only four decisions because I have only four interfaces. So for each route, I will say I, I live with interface one, interface two, interface three, or interface four. So I have very few choice, but I learn all the complexity of the world and my local decision is just to send to R7, R1, R9, or R11. So, uh, we would like to, to simplify this. So another solution is to build a layer two network. So this layer two network can be an, a Mac uh, Ethernet network or can be an ATM network where I will create path, switched path to go from all the other routers. So if I do that, it means that here I, I will create a circuit, for example, for R7 to uh, R1 that goes through S8, switch 8. So it means that here the number of state in these switches are very limited. We can imagine that since we have uh, six border routers, uh, seven border routers, and we, so we have to go 
to six over border routers. So it means that I will have, for one router, I will have six paths. Since I have seven routers, I may have a maximum of 42 possibilities. So it means that the maximum number of entry will be 42. Because here, the goal of this switch is just to send the information to another provider edge. So this way I limit a lot the number of entry in these switches. So here you have, for example, from router 7, the six possible paths. And of course, you have to multiply it by the number of products. But the problem is here that I will have some BGP connection between all these routers. And I will exchange all my knowledge of the network to all my peers, it means all the other routers. And here, in fact, I will repeat the same thing on all the paths, all the paths I have created. Because for me, at layer 3, I have a full mesh. It means that I have full connection, different connection, and each connection go to a specific router. So this is my view at layer th uh, 3. I can talk directly for each router. But at layer 2, we see that only I have only one link. So I will repeat things several times on the same link. And so this solution is good because it decreases the number of um, entries in my core network. But it has a big drawb drawback is that I am not aware of the to network topology. So what could be good? Could be if I was aware of the network topology inside my network, I will be, a bit, I will be able to, man to send only one advertisement, one information on the network, and it will be copy here and then copy everywhere. And of course, here, I put, I may have established some static links. So if, for example, this, the link between S8 and S11 fails, and I have configured manually the path here, then I have no more connectivity between R2 and R7. So I, I would like to have things that configure automatically. And if S8, S7 uh, fails, then to go through S9, S10, and S11. So that's one. I need a protocol to establish my path. So I can develop my own protocol, but I can reuse also things that has been done at the ITF, and for example, use my IGP protocol to establish that link. And so that's the magic we will see with MPLS. It means that we can use OSPF or IS to IS to create this and be able to know things at link layer. So we are going to, to use MPLS to do that. I will explain you after in the slide how it is work. But the advantage of MPLS is that we are going to learn new acronyms. So we didn't have a lot of acronyms until now in the class. So I will just give you some of the names. So in fact, we will not call a router a router because it's no more a router. It's more than a router. In fact, if you remember what we say at the beginning of uh, routing class, we say that a router is divided in two parts. You have the supervision part, or what I call also uh, the user part, where you have a routing protocol that runs. And it talks, if I look at the Linux vision, to a kernel part where you have the FIB. So the FIB analyzes a packet. So 
So you receive, for example, an IPv4 packet. You look at the header, and you find the exiting interface. And you send the packet. So this is a router. Now, what I want to do with MPLS is to do switching. So if I do switching, I am at layer 2. So I will add something here. And this thing will do forwarding or switching at layer 2. I will not do use fib. But I will continue to use my IGP to control the network. So in fact, I will be a router because I'm running a routing protocol. But I will be a switch because I am no more forwarding frames at layer 3. But I am switching, I'm no more, sorry, forwarding packets at layer, at layer 3. But I am switching frames at layer 2. So that's why we will call this uh, LSR for label switch router. So we can use that name, or I can also say an MPLS router, if you prefer. So I will use both of them. So what does it mean? It means we have already learned two names. Here, for the forwarding, we have a forwarding information base. And for the routing, we have a routing information base. So of course, when we create this kind of thing, we are going to invent a new database. And this database has two names. One I never remember is the NHLFE, Next Stop Label Forwarding Element. Or I will call also a lib label information base. So here, it will be something that allows me, when I receive a label on a certain interface to find the exiting interface on the label I will use on that exiting interface. So this, we will see this thing is very simple to understand. And there is not a lot of problem to, to see how the network works using these, these things. But of course, one question, one question remains is, how to create this lib. And then we will have different techniques to uh, create this lib. One of them will be to use a protocol in conjunction with the IGP, which is called LDP, Label Distribution Protocol. So it will run also in the application state uh, space LDP. So LDP will be used to make things automatic. So the routing decision chosen by my IGP will be copied into the lib to take the path chose, chosen by the IGP. Or I can force other path and reserve resources. And this will be done by another protocol called RSVPT. So TE means traffic engineering. An RSVP is a reservation protocol that we'll use to do that. So I will not talk about this part. I will just focus on the first part on LDP. The rest will be seen in red. So to have a better vision than the thing I have drawn in uh, the whiteboard, the blackboard. So here we are going to understand why we call MPLS multi-protocol label switching, but here we are focusing on multi-protocol. So multi-protocol means that I can have multi-protocol at layer 2. So maybe I can have here a point-to-point -point link using PPP, point-to-point -point protocol, and here an ATM interface, so using another kind of structure. And I can unify the vision between point-to-point on -point ATM. So that's why I'm multi-protocol here. And I am also multi-protocol because when I am switching a packet at the MPLS layer, I don't go at layer 3. 
So I never look at the packet format. So if I have a label, I can carry anything on it. This system will never analyze what we have. So we are going to, to see that. So just to remember you, remember you the adjustment. So here I have my IGP that discover the network topology and I talk with LDP to create labels. So I put this label into my lib, our network uh, next up uh, label forwarding element. And when I receive, or as a PTE, I as I say. So when I receive a packet or a frame, it depends. Here it's very difficult to know if it's a packet or a frame. So it arrives on the interface, go at the MPLS layer, we look at the lib, we find the exit interface, and we send the packet here. And my IGP and my LDP or RSVPT will use IP to communicate with the other element on my network. So what does it mean? It means here that I have a very strict separation between the control plane and the switching plane. Because here, my packets are going through MPLS, but I don't care about IP to do this forwarding. So that's why I'm also multi-protocol, because I can carry here a protocol that is totally different than the IP protocol I am using to exchange information internally between my neighbors. So that's why also I am multi-protocol, either at layer two because I can have different protocol, or at layer three because on a circuit I can carry anything. And it's a property we will use a lot when we will talk about uh, transition between IPv4 and IPv6, for example, because this way you can have elements that talk only IPv4 and you are able to switch IPv6 packets. So that's something very efficient because I don't have to change all my elements in my router. My P uh, routers can remain IPv4 only but I am able to carry on them some IPv6 traffic. So it's a way for a provider to deploy a new infrastructure without changing everything on the network. So here is the definition of multi-protocol. So we have seen for multi-protocol, MP from MPLS. So now on, we are going to see the L on the S. But just before, we, what we can do with MPLS, in fact, we don't need label, label. I can do it with tunnels. For example, I have my network here with P provider edge here on my P element. And one way to make things transparent for P element is, for example, I have a packet that arrives here for a destination alpha. And I don't want to populate all my routers here, my P routers, with an entry to alpha. Is that I create a tunnel and I encapsulate my IP packet on that tunnel. So what will be the advantage is that here, the first packet will contain source address and destination address of the internal interface of my PA, P. So here, the P router will know only internal routes of my network and will never know about what is outside. So this solution is totally equivalent to what I'm doing with MPLS. 
So why do we need to invent MPLS since we can do it by tunnels? And if I look at performances, here I am forwarding IP packet with a very small fib because the fib is just populated by internal routes, so it will be very efficient. So why do we prefer to invent a new protocol instead of using tunnels? One reason is that if forwarding is very efficient, the creation of the tunnel, the, encapsulation, the IP encapsulation inside an IP packet is very complex to do. So normally it is done by your supervision card in your router. So it means that it's done by software and you have all the limitations of this kind of things. So if you are doing a tunnel, tunnel, the cost is not in forwarding in the tunnel, the cost is to put the header at the entry of the tunnel and to remove the header at the exit of the tunnel. So, because IP is complex. MPLS will be easier because instead of adding a complete IPv4 header before our IP header, here we'll just put a small label, so it's only 32 bits, between layer 2 and layer 3. And this operation, this can be done very easily by hardware. So that's why label will be more efficient. So here we have an, exam la an example of label. So as I say, a label is 32 bit. 32 bit which are composed of four fields. One is a label by itself. So it's a value that will be switched when you cross uh, LSR or MPLS router. So it's 20 bits. And then you have three bits for traffic class. It means that you can differentiate, differentiate the forwarding on these bits, but that will be when you do quality of service. We'll not look at this. You have one bit that is a stack. And what does it mean, a stack? It means that you can stack labels. So in a PDU, you can put several labels, each one on top of the other. But, usually, but only one will be active is the first one. So we'll see that this stacking is very important to manage well a network. And we'll see in the future different examples why it's useful to have this kind of uh, stack. And then we have a TTL. TTL means for time to live. And it's a copy of what we have at layer 3. Because since, if we look back to, to that slide, we are never going up to layer 3. So each time we forward, uh, we switch uh, MPLS frame, then we don't decrement layer 3 TTL. And as I said just before, MPLS just obey to IGP. So the route taken by the packet at the MPLS level will be the same as the route taken by MPLS uh, by, uh, by MPLS. So if my IGP is not good, well configured, my IGP will create loops. And if I don't have the same mechanism at layer 2 than at layer 3, I have no way to stop the impact of the loop. So that's why when we create the label, we take the layer 3 TTL, and each time we cross a label switch router, this label, this TTL will be decreased by 1 until it reaches 0. So when you put a, a frame, a switch, uh, a label here between layer 2 and layer 3, then you have to indicate at layer 2 that we are, you are carrying MPLS. So one solution, for example, is an Ethernet 
is to use the protocol uh, that say that the upper layer is MPS. One problem we may have here is that you see normally in Ethernet, when I put 800 in the type of Ethernet, I know that it's IPv4. Or if I have 86 DD, I know that it's IPv6. Here, when I say that it's MPLS, I don't I lose, I'm losing what will be at layer 3. So I don't know anymore if it's IPv6 or IPv4. So that's why we may stack two labels, because the first label will be used to forward the packet on the link, and sometimes the second label will be used to indicate what is the protocol used at layer 3. Sometimes it's, it is done on the same label. So we see that some values say the upper layer is IPv4 or the upper layer is IPv6, but not on all uh, situations. So we will see that uh, with example. And if your label, layer 2 is ATM or frame relay, it means <coughs> that it's also circuit oriented. So in that case, we copy the label of MPLS to the layer 2 and then we give it a layer 2 that will send it to the destination. So, ah yes, the labels are unique either by machine, so you give a unique label for all of your interfaces, but most of the time the, uh, the label is unique on one interface of your machine. So you may have value 41, 42, 33, for one interface, on the same value on another interface. So, as I say, uh, you have special label. So when you have label zero, it means that you must suppress the label and give it to the layer three, and the layer three is IPv4. If you have label two, then you suppress the label and you give it to layer 3 and this layer 3 is IPv6. So these are the possibilities. So we are going to, to see how it works in uh, example. So I already talked about that. So now let's have an example. So we have seen multi-protocol, we have seen label, so now we are going to see switching. So when I'm doing switching, it's like ATM. It means that we are going to receive a packet or a frame with a label. The label is unique on the link. So we cannot copy it without any ambiguity on another link. So we are going to, to switch to change the value. That's why we call it label switching. So what we need is, uh, of course, a list of labels, but we have also to give to each interface a name, and here I will use a small letter to, uh, to do that. So, here, this router, R7, wants to send a packet alpha to R4. So, first, this router, I will have a special name. It's what we call a FEC. Um, LER, sorry, label uh, edge router, and this label edge router will take the IPv3, IPv4 packet and look at the prefix, destination prefix, and will know that he has to send it an interface A with label 10. Then, here I will have another table that say, when I receive something on interface D, which has label 10, then I have to send it on interface B with label 20. So I send it here. And here, I will have, you see all the paths. It means that here I, uh, I will have C. I receive on C with 20. I send it on B with 10. I arrive here on the last router. On the last router, may may say, for example, 
when you want you are on D, you receive something on D with level 10, then you suppress it and you do a pop. It means that you remove the, your label. You know that it's IPv4. So you send the normal IPv4 frame and you reach. So there is a mistake here. But you reach L3 and then you can send it to alpha. So this is quite easy to understand how we do label switching. We have this list of labels and interface on which we receive and on which we send. We can do something more complex. It's, for example, here. L1 wants also to send packet to alpha. So here I have also my label edge router that will receive the packet and look at the destination and see with the prefix is alpha. So it has in uh, its table uh, information that say you have to send it an interface A and you have to use label 25. So here I will have a more complex, more complete table. But say that when I receive something on interface A with value 25, I can send it on interface B with value 20. And it's the same as the previous one. So it means that I don't have to create another path here. I can use the same path to send packets. And that's something I didn't have before. Now, for example, if my table here, my table is called a fake forwarding equivalence class, says that two prefix, for example, alpha and beta, so alpha is sent to interface A with value 10 and beta is sent to interface A with value 10. So here with MPLS, I can be sure that both of these destinations will follow the same path. In IPv4 or in IP with IGP, you remember that when I have my fib, and my fib say when I want to send to alpha, I select next stop one, and when I want to send to beta, I have next stop one, I cannot guarantee you that the packet will follow the same path. Because my next stop one or any other router on the path may have different routing tables that say that alpha is uh, next stop 12 and beta is uh, next stop 15. And so, I have no guarantee that the packet will follow the same path. Here, I know from L7 that all packet targeted with A and 10 will follow the same path to the destination. So I have a better vision of what I'm doing in my network than just with forwarding. So that's another interest. So now, the tricky question what is a little bit more complex, now that you understand everything about IGP, we are going to introduce another level of complexity by adding a new protocol, a new tables, and we are going to see how we build them. So, you can build them manually. So you go on all your LSR, your MPS router, and you say, when I receive this label on interface uh, Ethernet 0, then I have to send them on Ethernet 1 with this label. So you cannot do it manually, but of course, there is a very few interest to do it manually because, of course, you, uh, you lose the dynamicity of a routing protocol. So the best idea, the better idea, is to rely on your IGP. So, if you are using your IGP, you are going to use label distribution protocol, a new protocol that we will see in more details in, uh, uh, in a few minutes. And you have two, two possibilities. One possibility is independent. 
It means that each time your IGP learn a new prefix, so you have your router, and through the IGP he is aware of a new prefix, then he will start to he will try to initiate routes to, to create paths. I have this new prefix, okay. I talk with my neighbors and we arrange to create a path. But it takes time and if you if you have ready your path, maybe other devices will not have your, the path ready, and so there is a kind of black hole for convergence time on your network. The other solution is order, and order means that you will create your path only if the network, the router before you, has already created the path. So this way, when the route is set on your network, on your router, you know that you can forward packet or switch packet. And another thing is that you will learn a lot of labels. So each time you have a label, you remember IGP, IGP floods the network with label. So it means that all the root router around you will know about this new prefix. So all the root router, so you are in your network, so there is a new prefix that appears. So all your network, all your routers around you, will tell you a prefix to go to that destination. But you, your IGP, has select a path. So a next stop. So you, your IGP tells you this is the way to go to that direction. So you have to remember this label. But other label can be forgotten because only this one will be used. So it's what we call liberal. The problem is that if some of the path here fails, then your IGP will detect it and will say, now the route to that destination prefix is this route. So you will have to use the label that this, this router, your neighbor here, previ previously tell you. But you have forgotten it, so you have to request it again. So it takes a little bit more time to, to establish the route, but the advantage is that you don't have to memorize all the labels that were given by all the routers. So, this is one way to create a uh, label or secret pass inside your uh, network. And we are going to see in an example how it works. So the, the third way to create labels is to use traffic engineering. But as I said, we'll not talk about that because we have a special class in REN on this. And the last possibility, or the fourth possibility, is to use BGP. And that's something very tricky. And we are going to see that when we will study BGP, because it's something very useful. Because this way you can, I will, in the first part of the class, just look inside our network. So here you, I don't talk about how you, you are connected to other providers. We just focus on our established path inside an, a domain. But when we combine with BGP, we have the advantage that we dissociate totally the outside space from the inside space. So it means that I don't need to have the same addressing scheme inside and outside of my network. So, as I said, it's useful, for example, to carry IPv6 over IPv4 because my core network can be IPv4, but using BGP, MPLS, I can carry IPv6 traffic on IPv4 equipment. I can do also the opposite. It means that I can build an IPv6 network and carry on that network IPv4 traffic. It's a solution. Uh, that the Chinese uh, network have chosen. But since I have 
two totally address the separate addressing scheme inside and outside. I can use also MPLS to isolate private routing. And for example, I may have two companies that want to be interconnected through my network. They use private addresses. And so I will interconnect these two companies using private addresses, but I will guarantee that they cannot exchange traffic. And this will be totally independent from my addressing scheme inside my network. So this is called VPN, and we will see also how it works. And in, when you will be in REN, you will have to uh, create also some uh, VPN using uh, some MPLS. OK, so just to give you an overview of the algorithm we are going to see. So we continue on our network to, be, uh, to use the same protocol, same IGP protocol. So we continue to have IGP, OSPF, or IS to IS on all the routers, LSR, inside your domain. So this, is, this doesn't change. So as I said, your IGP will collect, will flood the information, and you will learn about prefixes, all the prefixes inside your network. So now what you do, when you have learned the prefix, you create a label for that prefix on each interface. And you send, using LDP, the label you have chosen for this interface and this prefix to your neighbor you can reach on that interface. Then you look at the path selected by your IGP, uh, IGP to go to that direction, and this way, you know that when you receive a prefix with this label from one neighbor, you know that this label was linked to a prefix. You look at, you have looked before to your and your GP, and you know where to send this prefix to the next neighbor. You know the prefix, the label given by the next neighbor, and so you create your switching matrix using the label you have given to the previous one and the label that has been given by the next one. Is it clear? No? OK. So let's have an example. It will be, uh, I hope, more easy to understand. So we are going to focus on R11. So this router is running BGP, um, IGP like OSPF or is 2 so here you have, just before in the example, I put some prefixes here. So it's very complex because you have a lo lot of Greek letters. I don't know the name. But I will try to, to make it. So here, first thing, so you run your SPF and you have flooding and you learn about all the prefixes. So here I can create a database. So what I didn't say before is that LSA means for link state announcement. So that's the OSPF terminology to sell the entry in the database. So here I know about all these prefix, beta, beta gamma, la, etc., lambda, and mu. So I know all the prefixes on my network. So we are going to, to focus, if my memory is good, on prefix yota. But here, since I know the, all the prefixes, I know also all the local vision of all the routers. So I am able to build my shortest path tree to all these prefixes. So here I have created my shortest path tree to all these prefixes. So next thing, for example, for prefix yota, but you can repeat it for all the other prefixes. But here we are going just to focus on one prefix. So I am going to announce to all my neighbors 
for Yota, you can send, if you want to send me traffic to Yota, please use label 100. So I tell it to R8, I tell it to R2, and I tell it to R10. So all my neighbors. Here, for simplicity, I select the same label value, but you can add other values. Okay? It just, it's a local meaning on your interface. So now, what I know. So here I receive also, since it's a distributed process, my IGP has made learn R8, R2, and R10 about prefix Yota. So my neighbors are also sending me labels toward Yota. So R8 tell me that if I use prefix, if you want to, to send me traffic to Yota, please use label 200. R2 will say, if you want to send me traffic to Yota, please use label 987. And R10 will say, if you want to send me traffic to Yota, please send me traffic using label 234. Here, it's a totally stupid process. It means that here, of course, it's totally stupid to send traffic to R2 toward Yota. Because Yota is at the opposite. Okay? But it's automatic, so I learn a prefix. I give a label to all my neighbors. So, what do I have now? I know that if I receive traffic from R2 for Yota, R2 will send it using label 100. It's what I told R2. So what I have to do now is to send the frame to R8, because R8 is my shorted path toward Yota. So what, what do I do? I create a matrix that says, when I receive traffic on interface A using label 100 I gave before for Yota, then I have to send it on interface C because it's what my IGP has decided as a shorted path tree on the next stop to join Yota. And since my, this next stop told me to use label 200, I put label 200 here. Then when I receive something on interface B, on label 100, I know this label 100 has been assigned. I say that it was for Yota, so I have to send it to C and with value 200. And same thing for C, it's totally stupid because here it means that if I receive something with label 100, then I send it again to C with label 100. So normally, this will never appear, but who knows? Maybe, for example, the path here will change, and I will be happy to have this information in my switching table. So, here, you see that interacting with IGP to learn the prefixes and select the path, talking with my neighbors to learn about the prefixes to the label, I am able to create this uh, label switching element, set this lib, to send, to uh, switch the traffic. And of course, R8 will do the same. We'll create something. So when he receives something, let's say an interface A with label 200, he will have select to send it on this interface with a label given by R9, etc., etc. Now, suppose that R, this link fails. So what will happen, of course, my IGP will detect that this link has failed, like in a normal network with MPLs. So these R8 and R9 will issue not a new topological vision of the network, and so I will build a new LSP a new, uh, sorry, a new uh, shorted path tree. 
So what do I do now? Is I know that I cannot send anymore to reach Yota. I cannot send anymore to R8. I, say I have now to send to R10. And here, so I don't cannot use this label, I have to remember the value that was given by R10 a long time ago, but I didn't use it because I prefer to use to R8. Two possibilities. If you are conservative, you remember here that you get 232 from R8. And here you just change and you put, I'm sending on B with 232. And if you don't remember, then you can request the label to R10, and R10 will give it you back, and this way you can populate your lib. So you see that we adapt to the dynamicity of the routing protocol. And we can recreate the fib when we change the lib, sorry, when we change the shortest path to. So, and of course this is done locally, and R2 will continue to send to R11 because from R2 point of view, the change here doesn't affect the next stop. Even if delta link was up, in any case you have to send it to R11. So the change of topology has no impact to R2. So, that's the, the idea of uh, MPLS. So, now we are just going to, to look at a, a strange behavior of MPLS is the POP. So, what is uh, the POP? It's how you can remove a label. So, there is two ways to do that. One, it's what we call implicit. It means that it's in your label, in your lib, and in, on the left of your lib. It means that when you receive something, you remove it, sorry, on, uh, on the, you, you remove it, and you never send a label with this value. So it means that when I see zero, a uh, three, when I see three, I remove the label, and I give it to the upper layer. The other solution is when I see zero or two, I remove the label, I'm uh, sorry, I send it on the link, and the receiver will remove the label and send it to the, the, um, to the upper layer. So we are going to see an example here, it will be clearer. So here, you see I have my, for example, here I want to reach R10, and then I want to, I will send this packet on the, on the link without MPLS encapsulation. So here I put my, my layer 2, and here I put label 0, and if you look, label 0 means IPv4. So here on R11, my switching table says that when you want to reach lambda, then you have to send it on interface B, with label 0. So I send it on interface B with label 0. And here, I have my IP layer. Then I arrive on R10. R10 see the label 0. So remove the label and put it on IP. The other solution is, for example, here, my switching here will be, my switching table here will be on R11. When I receive something for lambda, so with a label I gave before, then I have, I have to send it on B, and with 3. 3 is implicit. It means that I will remove my MPLS label, and I will send it directly in IPv4 to that link. What is the advantage of doing that? Is that here I don't have to cross the MPLS layer. Because here I go to MPLS, but it was not useful because it was just to go just after to IP. 
So this way it's a little bit more optimal because I go directly to the IP layer. So you have both possibilities. Okay. So that was uh, a presentation of uh, MPLS. So now we are going to, to start a big part of the class, which will be external gateway protocol. And as I said last time, there is normally we don't use EGP as a generic name, because here there is no problem. There is only one protocol that is external protocol in the internet world. It's border gateway protocol, BGP. So we are going now to, to focus less on the network. If you remember, at the beginning of a class, we talk about IP. So we were looking at hosts. So I talk about host on routers. And we saw default route. Then when we start looking at IGP, we don't care about host. We just look at how routing can be uh, information as, uh, is exchanged between routers. And now we are going to, uh, to avoid routers and we are going to talk about domains and see how these domains can interact and form a graph. And this graph is the internet. So here it will be a, a small view or a view from far away on the network and we don't care about how many routers we have inside. Of course, we will have interaction between routers because if we don't have routers, of course, there is no internet. So we will see when we have seen generically how it works, how we can interact between BGP and your IGP. Okay, so what I told you uh, and you have seen in the example of this morning where we have a network and we have just to type two lines and your IGP was working. So an IGP or SPF or IS to IS discover automatically in the neighbors. So you don't configure the neighbors with uh, an IGP. You just say, I am running OSPF, I am running IS to IS, I am running RIP, and you have broadcast, multicast on your network, and by using a multicast group, all the router belongs to the same multicast group, they learn about each other. And when they are learned about each other, they start exchanging information. So of course this can be dangerous, because if you put a rug router, then you can get some information or you can inject wrong information into the network. That's why we need also to cipher or to have some key to allow only authorized router to talk each other. But here you have almost nothing to do. And the other thing is that the goal of IGP is to use optimal, optimally your resources. So to find the shortest path. So that's what would you want when you are running an IGP. To have something that is totally automatic because you are lazy. When we talk about this internet graph, at this level we don't have the same constraint. First one, maybe when I want to talk to this guy, I prefer to use this link than this link. Because here, politically, it's better to do this communication than this one. So, and for example, I may also, or another policy, for example, I can talk with this guy, I can talk with this guy, but I cannot talk through this one directly because I avoid to, to pay my resources to make interconnection. 
So here, the way you are going to select your routes is not from a technical manner. It means that it's the best path because I have more bandwidth. I have the less router to cross. But it's because I have agreement. I have an agreement, for example, to exchange traffic with UNAM because I want to talk with a student of UNAM. But I don't want to use UNAM to go to the US because UNAM doesn't want to pay for, the tra for my traffic to the US. So it's not the case, but it's just an example. I don't know a lot of names in Mexico, so I use the name I, I know. So you will have some policies. And your routing is not just from technical point of view, but you have to include this policy. It means that you will have more configuration to do with BGP. Another thing is, when I have my IGP, everything is automatic. So if I inject a mistake on my network, then the mistake will be propagated everywhere, and the network will collapse, or may collapse. So what will happen? It's not a problem. You will be fired and the company will uh, take another engineer and the other engineer will do the job. They made a mistake and the mistake has an impact on your company. But that's all. The problem with BGP is if you make locally a mistake, this mistake can be propagated everywhere on the internet and you can break the internet. For example, I am announcing the prefix of Telecom Bretagne from ITAM, because, for example, I take my uh, computer and my computer was doing this. It was working well at Telecom Bretagne. I come here and I continue to do it, and I may break the connectivity of Telecom Bretagne. But I also may attract some traffic that are not from Telecom Bretagne. So that could be a problem. So what we are going to do with uh, BGP is to be totally paranoid. And I will check with whom I'm talking. So that's totally different with IGP. IGP, you are on the same multicast group, so you talk each other. Here, I will have to say, I want to talk with this router. And you will have to say to the other router, I won't accept traffic from this router. So, to work, both of them will have to be configured to talk each other. So you cannot receive BGP connection or BGP peering from an equipment you don't know. So that's different. So you have to configure with the router with, with uh, which you will talk. Then, you have some prefixes. So your IGP will collect all these prefixes. But if you send these prefixes to the other one, it means that I accept traffic to these prefixes. And maybe you have some network that you want to remain idle because you have some very important server or very important information, and you don't want other people to connect to that server. So here, you will filter this announcement and you will not send it to that guy, to that other company. So here, you are going to lie. So you don't say wrong things, but you lie by not telling all the truth. So you will not send all your prefixes if you want. And of course, the other one will have to check if what will you send is correct. For example, I have a 10 slash 8 network in my domain. I have an IGP that collects all the prefixes used in my domain. And then, stupidly, I inject everything on BGP. So it means that now 10 slash 8 belongs to me. So if there is no control, all the, ten, the traffic on 10 slash 8 can go to my company. 
And of course, we want to avoid these kind of things. So it means that we will have a double check on what you are sending here, because maybe you don't want to tell all the truth. And you have a double, another check as a reception, because maybe you don't say only all the truth, but you add some things you, don't, you are not allowed to do. So it means that we will we check everything on BGP. So that makes the protocol totally different. We will call them routing protocol because they are used to send prefixes and populate fibs. But the behavior is totally different. Here in IGP, the protocol is complex. But the configura configuration is simple. In BGP, it's the opposite. The protocol is very, very simple. It's a TCP connection between two equipment. But the configuration is much, much more complex than for an IGP. So we are going to, to see how it works, of course. And we are going to see different ways to configure and different uh, strategy to, to run that on a network. So, First, here we have a network. So the green part is in France. The blue part is in Mexico. So uh, what can we do? So we have a company that is working in France and in Mexico. So, um, so in France, this company takes a provider, and in Mexico, this company takes Telmex, for example, <laughs> as a provider. I don't know other provider, <laughs> and I don't know if there is other provider. <laughs> so uh, here we have. So you manage this company, and of course, you want Mexican traffic to go to to Mexico, and the French traffic to go to to live from France. Okay. So this is one possibility. Is you have some provider aggregable prefixes. And so you will have this part using Mexican prefixes, the blue part, and the green part will use French prefixes. So first, what I do, I run an IGP. And my root border router here are member of this IGP protocol. So they will learn about French prefixes and Mexican prefixes. OK? So you have a list of, pre of the old, pref old prefix used in your network. And then you send, using BGP, this prefix list to your ISP. So what will happen? what Telmex will say. So in that case, here I have Telmex. And Telmex will say, what's this prefix? If first taken prefix, I don't know them. I never heard about the, this. I just allocate you a Mexican prefix. So here you will have filtering. And only Mexican prefix will be authorized. So your provider here will refuse French prefix. On the other side, First Telecom will say, OK, I agree to announce outside French prefixes. But Mexican prefixes, I never heard about this. So I will not use them. So what does it mean? It means that here, when I will have traffic, for example, to a Mexican site that want to join a resource in Mexico, will use this ISP. Uh, of course, here it's if I is everything is accepted. Sorry. Uh, so uh, let's. We go on the other example, and I will go back to this one. So here what happens? 
A Mexican site here want to join a server of my company in Mexico. So here, of course, I will reach it that way. Now, if I want to reach a French server, so we have no announcement from the Mexican part. The only announcement comes from the French part. So it will go that way. And same thing for a French uh, host that want to connect to the French server, it will go directly here. And if you want to go to Mexico, it will use internet resources and will enter at the last moment into my company site. So maybe it's a good strategy because if you do that, you don't use the internal resources of your company. So this way, you use internet and the cost of internet is not uh, supported by your company. So that's a possibility. But suppose now you're Amazon. So here you have Amazon or Google. Amazon.mx and here Amazon.fr. And I am in France and I would like to buy some Mexican books. So I have two solutions. The first one is to rely on internet. But maybe it's not a good solution because you know internet is not so stable. We don't have a lot of good quality of service. So my idea will be to attract the customer as fast as possible into my network. So the Mexican customer that want to buy French books will go in Amazon network and will go to France using Amazon network. And vice versa, the French that want to buy Mexican books stay, goes into the Amazon network as fast as possible and then I lead it to my Mexican server. Is it possible to do that with this scenario? So, suppose that now I take some agreement with my ISP and I say, okay, I give you some money because I know for you it's a lot of work to do that. So here is plenty of money and you announce all my prefixes. So I announce my French and my Mexican prefixes here. And here you announce my French and my Mexican prefixes. So this way I should have this. Okay? Is it true? We have, we have this kind of thing. And the answer is no. Here the situation will be worse than that. Because if I am using provider aggregable prefixes, I will ask my Mexican provider to announce here the Telmex prefix let's say slash 16, and the French prefix, but not all France Telecom prefix, would be stupid, so only the part that has been allocated to me by France Telecom. So, so let's say here a slash 24. And on the opposite side, I will have France Telecom here, that will announce is prefix aggregated, so let's say a slash 16, and replace the part only allocated by me by, for, by, for me by Telmex, a slash 24. Now, a Mexican user wants to buy a Mexican book. Where does it go? You are in Mexico, and you want to go to that Mexican server. Where do you go? Here, you will use the longest prefix match. So here, to go to Mexico, to this site, 
I have something on 16, and I have something more specific on 24. What do I do? I go to France to go enter the network and go to Mexico. So it's not the best solution to interconnect. And same thing, of course, for France. So it means that here, in that case, I cannot use provider aggregable addresses because it leads to something totally stupid in terms of routing. So what will I do is to use provider independent addresses and I will have my own prefix, but I will ask for a earlier, for example, and I will announce it, and I will take agreement on my two ASP to announce my, my prefix. So this way, the prefix size of my PI will be the same in France and Mexico, let's say, slash 24. And this way, if I am in Mexico, of course, I will receive announcement from France, there, but they are not that good. I receive better announcement from Mexican part, so I will go here. And if I want to go to a French server, it will depend. We are going to see how it works. But normally, if I announce everything, then I will use the resource of my company to go to France. It depends how I announce things outside. So now I can manage how I want things to be done. The other thing I just, so I told you that BGP will block prefixes if you don't take agreement with your provider. But also in forwarding, you remember that if you don't use the appropriate, so it's not only at the routing level, but at the forwarding level, we'll check also the correctness of the address. And if, it, if his address is not correct, then the ISP will block the forward to avoid address spoofing on all the things we, we saw about the, this kind of attacks. So here, now, when you are multi-homed, so you have two solutions when you are multi home Either you do private addressing and you put NAT on uh, each side, and then when you leave, you translate your address to the address of your provider. And this way, there is no problem. So this is another solution, but this solution works well only if you don't have server inside. If you have server inside, then you are obliged to use PI addresses with the impact on the size of core routing table. So now, I have PI addresses and I am, uh, I can manage how I want. So for example, one solution here is to have my prefix list. So I run my IGP, I collect all my prefix. I do aggregation, for example, and then announce my prefix, my aggregated prefix here to my ISP. And my ISP will propagate this information worldwide. So it means that when C wants to join A, he will go through ISP1 and my brother will turn 1 and will join A. If C wants to join B, which will be the path? What will be the path? So here, since ISP just send left prefixes. It will not give the prefix from B. So the only one that announces the prefix from B is ISP2. So it means that in that case, the traffic to B will go uh, from C to B will go through ISP2. Okay? So this is one strategy. This strategy is outside traffic don't use my internal resources. So they, they stay as long as possible on the internet and at the last point they enter into my network to reach the element. So this is one strategy. 
The other strategy, for example, is to announce everything as we saw. Now, if we look at the other possibility here, I can announce a default route. So internally, using my IGP, all my border router will announce a default route. So what it means? It means that when A wants to go to C, it will leave as fast as possible my network and go in the internet. Now when A wants to join D, don't care about D, it's outside, so it will join D. How much? Something I will never do is to inject the totality of routes, internet route, inside my core network. Because here you see it lead to 350,000 routes inside all my routers. So maybe I can do some traffic engineering to try to, for example, I want to join B, D, I can stay here, but it will be very complex to manage. So now look at the simplest configuration I can have on my network. Simplest means that here, I just inject, I receive all the prefixes from my area and I send it to my ISPs and I inject internally a default route. So what will be the path for D to join E? D to join E. E, sorry. D to join A, no, because here I'm, I'm sending all the prefixes. So D will go to ASP2, BA2, and internally to A. And when A answers through BA1, and we'll go here. So what does it mean? It means that here I have created an asymmetric route. Okay, so we talked this morning during the exercise about asymmetric routes, and it's not something that is exceptional on the internet. It's something very easy to create. So when you have something that is symmetric, usually it's because you have only one path to go from one point to another. And when you have several paths, you have a graph, then you are very lucky if the packets are going on the same way on the both direct direction. So which means that when it doesn't work, when D cannot reach A, you have four possibilities. One is that there is a problem, so I do an on D, and I am on D, I do a ping on A, and I have no answer. One possibility is that my ping request doesn't arrive to A. Another possibility is that the answer doesn't arrive to D. So this is two possibilities, and these possibilities are in the forwarding plane. Now, the other possibility is that the prefix from A doesn't arrive to D. So if the prefix doesn't arrive, then I cannot send packets. But it's not a link failure is more that there is a configuration failure and as I told you there is politics in routing so it means that maybe you have some uh, conflicting rules that means that your prefix is never announced to the internet or some part of the internet will not receive it and of course so if you cannot send your prefix to D then you cannot have traffic to D to A because when you announce route in one way, is to get traffic on the other way. And the other possibility is that the prefix to D never arrive to A. So in that case, the, the answer cannot uh, come back. So when one of your user come and say, I cannot reach this server, you have to look at these four possibilities. 
Is it a forwarding problem or is it, and in which way it is a forwarding problem? Is it a routing problem and in which way it is a routing problem? And the funny thing is that you are in the internet, so you don't have global state. So you see only your local vision of things. And from that, you have to find a way to, to solve the problem. So we will see how we, we can do that in the next class. So another case, which is totally stupid, but doesn't exist in reality. But here you see I'm learning all the prefixes. So here from BGP, I learn about 350,000 roots. I inject them in my IGP. And here in my IGP, so I've learned all the roots. So I send them in my ISP. So if I can do that, I will become an ISP. So when D or C will learn, wants to join D, then it will not use the internet resources, but, will the resource, but use the resource of my company. And so, of course, my boss will not be, be very happy because I will have to pay for, to interconnect to companies. 